Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Soria, for the kind introduction, and I'm pleased to be here. And I will uh, tell you a little bit about our thinking, uh, and, and I'll, try to, um, I'll try to keep this kind of, uh, I'll give some review on kind of how we and others have thought about precision medicine in the past, but I'll try to spend a lot of the time forward looking what are the challenges and what are the uh, opportunities to overcome those challenges. So this is my disclosure information at the present time. So when we and others have pursued our research directions in cancer precision medicine, we have tended to uh, use this kind of, uh, this kind of engine, uh, schematic engine, if you will. So uh, as you know, it starts with the patient and uh, a set of profiling and, and often uh, sometimes this is done on archival material, but increasingly, as you've heard several times a day, the idea of fresh biopsies for a variety of types of profiling is of, of great interest. Uh, and then with that information, there needs to be a data interpretation framework and a decision support mechanism that allows an, a clinician to make a management decision. And that decision, sometimes it's use of approved therapies, but certainly when we talk about actionable for example, genetic alterations, a lot of the time it's about uh, decision, about clinical trials. And, and this is, as you heard uh, this morning, actually from our uh, organizer, uh, this is a major uh, question that's driving a lot of clinical trials is uh, to what extent and how will genetic information be used to, to um, drive useful management decisions. And then, of course, with that, uh, we, we move increasingly into the research realm by asking, is there a clinical response? We may, uh, th th there's certainly great interest. I think sometimes the interest outweighs the uh, availability of sampling during the course of treatment so we can understand, is our treatment working? Is the drug hitting the target? And is the hypothesis being tested about clinical response? Uh, but then, of course, uh, as we move further kind of into uh, the progression, uh, often, as we all know, drug resistance develops, and there's been a lot of efforts <coughs> to generate biopsies at the time of resistance uh, with the hopes of either specifying salvage therapy or increasingly thinking about new therapeutic regimens uh, that the next count patient with, for example, a similar OMA profile might encounter. So this kind of schematic has driven a lot of precision medicine. But I think it's also fair to say that much of the data that we've seen over the past several years has been in the area of the technology. So can we feasibly do profiling? And so our lab uh, early on was, uh, it was interested in bringing genomic technology such as they were into the clinic. We started with uh, what now seems like it should be in a museum, the use of mass spec genotyping uh, to read out a, a panel of actionable alterations. That actually moved into kind of a, um, a prototype precision medicine effort in our institution, uh, a platform that we called Oncomap. Then, of course, as massively parallel sequencing came along and, we, and it became clear that one could make large gene panels uh, and capture them and read out various types of alterations, including copy number and rearrangement patterns. That, too, uh, kind of fueled uh, at, at, at ours and many other institutions, both academic and commercial, uh, the ability to do this. Uh, we have uh, sampled uh, <coughs> the idea that perhaps whole exome sequencing could, could add additional value. At the present time, you know, we're not convinced that there's, that the, the incremental additional value of, although there's certainly a lot more information for discovery, uh, in, ter in terms of where we are clinically, we're not necessarily convinced that this is all that much better than targeted panels because one can use, uh, if, if the panels are sufficiently large, one can still use these panels to infer mutational load and that kind of thing. But nonetheless, the technology uh, and, and uh, deciphering uh, how it can be used has been really a, ma a major anchor of how people have thought about precision medicine research. But I think we're now at the point, though, where we can step back and say, well, the technology is, is great, and, it, and it's become, at least on the somatic genetic side, it's become routine. Lots of people are doing this. So now the question is, well, if the whole framework, if the whole cancer precision medicine framework is going to be successful, what will success look like? Can we picture what success is going to look like? Uh, actually, before I get into that, I, I should just point out at our institution, but I think this is true for many institutions, uh, the use of these kinds of 
uh, gene panels, large and small, uh, is be has become increasingly practical. Uh, actually, I think this number is now greater than 11,000. And so what, and, and so just to kind of close the loop of kind of present day uh, precision medicine, the idea of profiling these patients, reporting back to oncologists, uh, uh, so that either through directly reports or review boards, but also putting them into knowledge bases where we can integrate clinical data and genomic data to learn correlates of response to prognosis and, and resistance and that kind of thing. So that's great. But getting back to the, the bigger picture, though, what it, when, we're, when we are done, because as has been mentioned already in this meeting and many others, it, the, it's still a smaller percentage of the time where this genomic information can actually be used uh, in line uh, with the clinical course uh, to actually help patients. And so when we picture what, what success might look like, uh, I think some of these features will be similar to what uh, Dr. Lord mentioned in his talk earlier today, but uh, obviously one anchor we expect will be genetic and molecular stratification. But here, <coughs> I emphasize uh, the term molecular, which I'm using as kind of a wastebasket term to point out that somatic genetics, although that's been where probably 90 percent of the effort has been in stratifying patients, uh, that is necessary, but probably not sufficient. We already heard a very nice talk of how there are all kinds of innovations in the area of immune profiling, and you can easily imagine that immune profiling, other molecular readouts besides somatogenetics, genetics, will need to be wrapped together to stratify patients for response to the spectrum of therapies that we have and will have. Uh, the second point is that we, we, I think, and many others believe that uh, durable control of cancer is going to be achieved through combinations. And, some, and these may end up ultimately being high order combinations, three or four or more drugs that are given to a patient uh, during a defined period of time. Uh, and then we would anticipate that we would be giving them up front as opposed to waiting until resistance to one of them develops. And then over, over time, the combinations may, may include components that target sort of index genetic or molecular dependencies but also immunologic vulnerabilities uh, and resistance mechanisms. So you can imagine that if we did have a set of pharmacopoeia of higher order rational regimens, that any given regimen of three or four or more drugs might have one or more of these components in it matched based on genetic and molecular stratification. Uh, another point that, again, we, we, we talk about a lot, but it happens much less commonly than we would like, is the idea of monitoring uh, whether or not we're achieving in the tumor what we think we're, uh, what we hope to achieve uh, with the rational therapy. So, our, so if we are able to move to the point where our, uh, our clinical trials are very clearly testing a hypothesis, and uh, part of the hypothesis is that we are hitting the target well enough, uh, and we need, therefore, approaches to monitor over time our, our target modulation activities. Uh, and, and the ability to adapt those regimens if we're not achieving appropriate target inhibition. But so, we, so this, this kind of city on a hill picture of precision medicine could take 10 or 15 years or more to get to, but I think it's uh, reasonable to postulate that if we could do all these things, rational deployment and real-time optimization of therapeutic combinations, we could see durable disease, disease control of many more cancer types than we do now. So, if that's true, if, if that's where we're ultimately trying to go, now the question is working backwards. How do we design our precision medicine research to get at these issues? And in particular, what are the proximal challenges that we need to overcome to do that? And there are many, but I'm going to focus on three for this talk. The first, which I'll spend a fair bit of time on, is the idea that uh, one gene, uh, one drug, which is sort of the way that we often think about, uh, and it's entirely appropriate, the basket trial construct of we're going to find a mutation and we're going to give a drug based on that gene mutation. Uh, it's necessary but not sufficient, so I'll unpack that in a second. The second is that our knowledge of resistance mechanisms remains uh, incomplete, and so if we could get to frameworks uh, that, that, get, that uh, advance that understanding substantially, that will clearly be needed. And then finally, uh, rational combination regimens, uh, although we talk about them, they remain uncommon. And you heard again this morning how, uh, how little of the, uh, of the proteome we are actually engaging in terms of our target development activities, uh, but, we'll, but I'll come back to that in a minute. So let me first talk about this point, the one gene, one drug patient stratification. I think this becomes obvious uh, when you consider the aggregate knowledge 
of the Cancer Genome Atlas and other similar studies of which I've been deeply involved and uh, been, uh, it's been very, fr very fruitful over the past several years. And the, that aggregate has been shown in many ways, but I mean, I think, you know, one of the most important readouts is the fact that driver genetic alterations as a whole and certainly what we call actionable or putatively actionable genetic alterations uh, tend to exhibit a long tail. And that long tail is seen here. That what, what we mean by that is that a relatively small number of genetic uh, of gene mutations are common, and common may mean greater than let's say 10 percent in a given tumor type. But the overwhelming majority uh, that are that have been or are being discovered are rare, uh, are less common. So less than 5 percent, sometimes less than 3 or 2 percent. And so when you look at this long tail, there are there are two ways to look at it. There's the, the glass half full and the glass half empty. The glass half full view says, well, since cancer is a multi-step process, this long tail need not scare us because it still could be the case that a significant proportion of cancers may contain at least one plausibly actionable alteration. So if we can really understand how to exploit at, the, at least this targeted therapy space, uh, we, can, we can make progress. And that is undoubtedly true. And, and, and we have we and others have evidence for this. So just briefly, a vignette that kind of supports that comes from a, a series of uh, projects we've done in collaboration with Jonathan Rosenberg and others and Ellie Van Allen uh, in bladder cancer where we uh, characterized a set of patients where we knew the response data. They were either complete responders or they were non-responders to neoadjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And you can see that some of the known genes here, P53RB, et cetera, distribute more or less randomly and independent of disease response. But there was one drug, one gene, uh, ERCC2, which piled up in the complete responding subgroup. And ERCC2 uh, is one of the DNA repair genes uh, that you heard more about DNA repair earlier today as well. Uh, and I don't have time to get into the specifics of how it works, but, but suffice it to say that we had in vitro data that indeed these ERCC2 mutations uh, could in fact impin impede the ability of, of cells to repair uh, damage from cisplatin chemotherapy. So already this was a hypothesis that this might be a way of determining, uh, for example, uh, a subset of, of cancer patients <coughs> that would uh, preferentially respond to platinum-based chemotherapy. And recently, over the summer, a validation set <coughs> from Fox Chase was published showing that once again, uh, bladder cancer patients with ERCC2 mutation generally are showing in this study 100 percent uh, response rate, whereas those without uh, are clearly doing worse. Uh, and then this is sort of uh, comparing to the initial study that we did. So uh, this data suggests that, again, uh, the genetic uh, discoveries can influence, can guide our uh, our uh, framework here, and that's true not just for targeted therapy, but even for standard cytotoxic chemotherapy. And when you now go back to this long tail framework, you say, well, actually, this, although bladder, clearly it's much more common to see ERCC mutations in bladder cancer, but you can clearly see a long tail of such mutations in other tumor types, several of which you wouldn't nor normally think about using platinum-based uh, therapy. And of course, there are other uh, DNA repair uh, mutations that are also seen with these kinds of patterns. So, so clearly, the point is that the, this molecular profiling, genetic profiling, is necessary to help move the needle, but the question now becomes, is it sufficient? And there are real concerns that we can uh, pose with the long tail. And uh, so, for example, in the end, when you start dealing with 2 percent, 1 percent uh, frequencies, is the proportion of patients that's going to benefit, is it going to be too small? And so, therefore, is the implied therapeutic framework too narrow. And, I, and so I think maybe if you take home nothing else from this talk, uh, to my mind, I think that uh, the necessary but not sufficient, you know, the, the framework that we currently have that we spend most of our effort in, it absolutely is essential, but it's not going to get us all the way to where we want to go. And so I'll just give a couple of examples of, of why that's true, and I'm sure you could think of many more, and these will probably already be obvious to you. So here's a, an example of uh, breast cancer. So this was a study, uh, one of the palbociclib studies that had been published over the past couple of years. Uh, in e estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, the combination of a CDK inhibitor, in this case palbociclib, together with letrozole, um, which is an ER-directed therapy, you can clearly see very impressive Kaplan-Meier curve uh, with the combination compared to letrozole alone, which would have been standard of care uh, for this. But so 
so on the one hand, CDK inhibition and estrogen receptor directed therapy are rational therapies in breast cancer. There is a lot of biology to support the use of those agents in breast cancer. And yet, uh, we do not have a robust way of stratifying who the responders and non-responders are. And moreover, uh, the, the canonical genetic alterations that we would have thought before uh, these studies were done would be stratifiers. For example, loss of CDK and 2A, which of course is a cell cycle inhibitor uh, tumor suppressor, cycle and D1 amplification, which of course partners with CDKs. You know, we would have thought that these would be, that these would be predictors, and they really aren't. Now, loss of RB is really uh, a marker of resistance and, and leads to resistance. But the bottom line is that our, although this is clearly a very interesting uh, uh, and very, very uh, impressive result, the molecular determinants of response and resistance are incompletely understood. So we have a lot more to discover with that. And then the other point, which you probably could have predicted that I would say, is that this is equally true in the area of immunotherapy. Um, so <clears throat> I won't walk through this because you, you know and you just heard how neoantigen load uh, may correlate with immunotherapy response. Uh, but uh, we and others, this is just data from our, our paper, but uh, there was data from, uh, from, of course, Tim Chan and others showing this as well. Uh, we can see that mutational load uh, clearly statistically correlates with clinical benefit, uh, in this case to ipilimumab. But, uh, but the mutational load by itself in this study was not sufficient to, you couldn't draw a line and say these are the responders, these are non-responders. And, and of course, many of you are aware that the, there are similar issues with, with PDL1. Clearly, PDL1 is a marker, but the levels and how to, do, how to make the cutoff, these are unclear. So the bottom line is that we have a lot of room to bring in new molecular stratification that can help us across the board, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, and combinations therein. So that's a huge opportunity for uh, both uh, precision medicine research, but also uh, coupled with uh, exciting clinical trials. Now, in our, uh, in our Center for Cancer Precision Medicine, we have, we therefore aspired to build an infrastructure that anticipated this need and that could, there, that could integrate with efforts that were designed to give us insights into where that additional molecular stratification is going to come from. So uh, over the past really, uh, really three years, but in, in practice it's been the past year that it's really been going, we've implemented a workflow where the concept is that for defined cohorts of patients that are receiving therapies of interest, uh, we can consent them for serial biopsies uh, either tissue or blood biopsies over time. So pre-treatment, on-treatment. We actually don't get that many on-treatments yet, but certainly pre and post. Uh, and so the, the idea here is that either they are surgical punches or they're IR biopsy cores, and we are going to get multiple cores per, per patient, you know, at least four to six and maybe more if it's safe. And, be, and with that number of samples, we can now go down for example, standard uh, targeted panel profile that I just showed you uh, earlier in this talk, but we can also send uh, additional specimens, for example, to the Broad for genome or exome and transcriptome characterization. Uh, we can do uh, even fancier analyses with uh, additional ones, maybe try to make cell lines. And of course, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the ability to get blood uh, biopsies is, is, is monthly is, is a big advantage. So we, uh, when we mocked up, when we, when we made this schematic, I have to say we were, uh, we were strident, but we weren't necessarily sure if we were going to be able to pull it off because it's relatively ambitious. But um, actually, uh, I, um, huh, I think I may have, oh, here it is. Okay. So the slides got reversed. But, but you can sort of see, and this is an example uh, from the first 10 months or so of, of one project where uh, we, you know, and at this point we now have well over 100 breast, ER positive breast cancer patients that have been enrolled on this kind of a cohort. And you can see that uh, we are routinely getting our four to six cores and, and processing them down this workflow. And you can say that even in half of the cases, we're getting more than six cores, which means that we're able to bank uh, additional tissue. So it used to be that what we would do is, do a research biopsy and we would bank first, and if we got one or two, and then we decide, well, what do we want to do with it? Now we flip this. We're getting enough cases where we can generate these data and then bank the rest for something in the future. And so this is very exciting. Uh, Nicole Wagley and Nancy Lin have led this study, and I'm sure you will hear more details of the actual biological findings that are coming out of this uh, going forward because uh, Nick is, is uh, preparing manuscripts on that. So, so the, the, the take home point of this 
of this portion of the talk is that, the, that from the standpoint of there's a need to do improved molecular stratification, the ability to discover what those molecular stratifiers are requires an infrastructure that can obtain multiple tissue and blood biopsies. And so in our center, we've implemented this, and uh, it's now starting to yield dividends in terms of, uh, of flow and throughput and results. Now, uh, <coughs> Very strange because I, my, um, okay, what, what's that? Okay, um, yeah, so, sorry for mixing up the slides. So now I mentioned that one of the components of that workflow is to really push the envelope on discovery. And so uh, one of the uh, technologies that we've been very interested in deploying there is single cell RNA-seq for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of which of course is the, is the increasing importance of understanding the components, the cellular components of uh, the tumor. So rather than kind of the bulk, the smoothie version of uh, profiling, which is what you know, our history has been, we can now really uh, break down the component parts, which are likely to be relevant for uh, newer types of therapies and combinations such as immunotherapy. So uh, one, I'll give just a couple of vignettes of how that's working, but before I do that, I have to kind of give you some background that one of the areas that we've focused a lot on is melanoma, and it turns out that there are transcriptional outputs that correlate with intrinsic response or resistance to MAP kinase pathway inhibition in melanoma. Uh, uh, a sensitizing uh, transcript is associated with high levels of MITF, which is sort of the master transcriptional regulator of melanocytes. Uh, so MITF and its target genes. And then there's a, uh, another uh, signature, which we call the axle high signature because of the axle receptor types in kinase and other genes. Bottom line is that there are two transcriptional outputs that correlate with either sensitivity or resistance in vitro, and there was uh, evidence, uh, so, so there are these alternative transcriptional states that can segregate. Uh, and so now, when we look at uh, a set of melanomas that were processed through our workflow, and uh, we did both bulk and single cell analysis, you can see uh, that the actual program and the MITF program, as we would expect, are represented at the bulk level. Uh, and we've seen, by the way, that uh, when, we've, when we've done bulk sequencing, uh, and, and, and bulk analysis of, of tumors, we and others have seen that, in fact, this correlation holds up in vivo, and, in, and indeed, the, the, um, the, the sensitive and resistance does correlate with a survival, a progressive free survival difference. But the reason I'm bringing all this up is because you can see the stratification at the bulk level, but when you go to the single cell level, what one realizes is that each tumor has cells that are members of both classes. So for example, this is an axle high uh, melanoma, and you can see that most of the individual cells follow that uh, profile, but there are a few uh, that are looking a little bit more MITF high, and conversely, in the MITF high, most of them are uh, following that program, but there are a few that are very clearly uh, in the axle high group, and you can begin to see this more or less in every tumor type that we've looked at. And actually, this is becoming a theme now in, mul in multiple cancer types. When you look at the single cell level, you start to see all of the transcriptional states that have been described, for example, in TCGA um, at, at the bulk tumor level. But for this, this tells us that the ingredients of resistance, of intrinsic resistance, are embedded in every tumor, even at the, uh, even at the transcriptional and, and the non-somatic profiling level. So that gets back to the importance of varied types of molecular readouts, not just somatic information. And we can validate this by IHC. Okay. But then the other side that was very interesting to us is the richness of T-cell biology and T-cell functional states that one can see uh, by single cell analysis. So obviously, as you might imagine, you can segregate CD4 positive and CD8 positives, but you can also then read out markers uh, such as FOXP3 and others that are associated with Tregs. You can, get, you can get a sense of whether they're naive or, uh, or cytolytic uh, already activated. Uh, but what was particularly interested, interesting to us was that the, the one can begin to see resolution into potentially uh, transcriptional readouts of exhaustion at the single cell level. And, and for example, uh, in general, there's a correlation between exhaustion-based markers and uh, cytolytic, uh, cytotoxic scores, but you can also begin to tease out differences, subpopulations of T cells that are highly active but have much lower exhaustion scores. And obviously, what we'd like to be able to do going forward is to enrich for these guys. I mean, the hypothesis is that 
high active, low exhaustion is going to be um, even better configured to respond uh, to immunotherapy. But more generally, that these kinds of readouts and the markers therein that specify them may end up being important to help us understand who, what, what patients are primed to respond to checkpoint blockade and what are the dynamics, what are the determinants over time of response and resistance. These are data that we don't always use or have not necessarily had available to us in, in prior studies of this, but certainly going forward uh, could be a big deal. Okay, so, so clearly uh, molecular stratification is, is important. We believe that the one gene, one drug uh, mechanism to do that is not sufficient, although it is necessary. So, so we, there's a lot of activity in our center and elsewhere uh, to try to gain a, additional understanding about what the stratifiers are. Uh, but I'm going to go, uh, actually, I don't know how much time I have left, but I'm going to try to, you know, march a little bit more quickly so we're not too far behind because uh, I know we already uh, lost the break. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to touch sort of very briefly on the issue of knowledge of resistance mechanism. And I'll close with sort of a new story that may teach us, give us insights into rational combinatorial regimens. So uh, I'm going to, the slide that I'm about to show will summarize probably about five or six years of work from our group and others of uh, frameworks to think about resistance. So, you know, it, historically, the way we have, <coughs> we and others have approached drug resistance has been uh, to uh, carry out a, a variety of experimental, 10 minutes, okay, to carry, carry out a variety of, of experimental studies, uh, maybe culture cells to resistance and then work out the mechanism and then take that mechanism and look for it and use often a very small number of clinical cases. And then we make these pie charts that imply that somehow there's one resistance mechanism per tumor. But in reality, we know that it's much more complicated. First of all, thinking about it at the one mechanism at a time level may not be as helpful. And certainly we know that there's just as much heterogeneity and multifactorial nature, even in the same patient uh, in resistance as there is with uh, various other readouts of heterogeneity. So, this schema then summarizes how we are now starting to think about resistance. And this is based on studies of BRAP mutant melanoma and response to MAP kinase inhibition, but also ALK rearranged lung cancer and uh, uh, response to ALK inhibition uh, and, and other contexts that are now uh, coming out. And so what the point here is that when you look at resistance from a high level, what one can see is that there are overarching categories of resistance that can, comp that can each comprise multiple mechanisms. So for example, in resistance to targeted therapy, uh, by far one of the most prevalent mechanisms, or, or uber mechanisms, if you will, of uh, resistance is reactivation of the downstream pathway. So in melanoma, you inhibit RAF and MEK, you get ERK signaling to come back on. But there are multiple, two plus dozen individual ways in which that can happen. Now, uh, there are other cases, and, there, and, and uh, we and others have, have published on this, where sometimes the pathway remains inhibited, uh, but there are bypass mechanisms uh, that can occur, and we, we've published uh, examples of that through systematic functional studies. But often those bypass mechanisms will still engage a similar oncogenic transcriptional output. So the transcriptional output uh, will, will look very similar. But as I alluded to with this uh, MITF high, axle high uh, phenomenon I, I mentioned before, there's this third category, which we understand less well, but we uh, call it a pathway in different cell states. So these are, for example, BRAF mutant melanomas that should respond. Since they have a BRAF mutation, they should respond to RAF and MEK inhibition, but they don't. And as I mentioned, those tend to have an alternative transcriptional output. We called it axle high, but the bottom line is that there's a distinct transcriptional state associated with intrinsic resistance. So right away, one can now say, well, if this is a framework and if we can begin to bundle our individual mechanisms that we've discovered into these frameworks, well, maybe the question will be, can we identify, are there cell states? Are there common cell states that, that are engendered? Whereas, yes, there are multiple mechanisms to get to those states, but there ends up being a finite number of resistant states, and could we find those? And so uh, another way of stating this is, looking at melanoma again, we think that in, in the typical patient that has widespread metastatic disease that's progressing on targeted therapy, the resistance mechanism is complicated. It looks like this. And so the idea of doing a profiling of resistance and thinking we're going to find one mechanism and that that's the one mechanism we should target, that may be futile. But on the other hand, if there are states, if there are underlying states that, underlie, that, that, um, that 
comprise resistance. The question is, can we, can we identify and target sort of these coalescence, so that where, where individual mechanisms converge onto, onto specific states, can we determine, for example, are there dependencies associated with those states and how might we approach that? Well, you know, so ERK, for example, you could argue in melanoma is one sort of coalescence, but given the importance of oncogenic uh, transcriptional outputs in melanoma and, and lung cancer and other places, perhaps this would be another example. And so the epigenetics talk you heard uh, might be an op opportunity if we can understand, for example, chromatin factors that are required to maintain these outputs and target those in conjunction with the signaling modules, that might be a basis uh, for combination. So we have started looking at this uh, by taking, for example, genes in open reading frames that we know from our functional studies can cause resistance and beginning to apply computational approaches to cluster these together. And so uh, what, what Ophir Cohen has done has been to render uh, the, gene, the transcript profiles that are associated with overexpressing a whole panel of known resistance genes in the absence or presence, in this case of MAP kinase pathway inhibitors, into a, into a resistant state map uh, where, um, where uh, various different genes begin to come together. And you can start to say, okay, well, you know, over here in this region of the state map are genes that we know reactivate the pathway, so that all makes sense. But then we go somewhere else and we say, well, wow, this is a, these are a set of genes that actually engender a transcript readout that has similarities to this actual high state that we saw before. That, well, that's encouraging. Uh, and then another point was that we could find, uh, sort of by unbiased searches, a CREB activation state, and this was one of the uh, bypass mechanisms. So the, the, a bypass module that we published uh, appeared, we, we, uh, we published a couple years ago to converge on CREB activation. So this is sort of an independent way of discovering this. Now there's a whole bunch of other uh, activity and possible clusters going on, and we're redoing this with much more um, high resolution RNA-seq data. But nonetheless, we think that this may be an approach to read out sort of underlying convergent state information that multiple individual mechanisms could lead to, and if we can begin to understand dependencies linked to those states, that could be another uh, basis uh, to go into what will be really the final few minutes of my talk, which is, you know, how, how do we come up with rational combinations? And I think there are going to be two frameworks to do that, uh, one of which, so on this schema that I just showed you, you can imagine, well, you know, hitting the pathway harder, hitting with ERK in addition to, for example, RAF and or MEC. Uh, hitting the transcriptional output perhaps with epigenetic therapies uh, and then, you know, understanding, discovering the dependencies here. And then, of course, we need to uh, continue hitting kind of the hallmarks, you know, the cell cycle, et cetera. Now, we, we can't do all of this in every single patient, but the question is, you know, if these are the bins, these are the frameworks on which we have building blocks for new combinations, we can certainly start with here as we begin to have frameworks in place for how resistance, for example, to an index uh, targeted agent arises. But the other point that was already made earlier in this meeting is that we really, there's a lot more space, there's a lot more target discovery to do, and the, the expansion of potential targets will be an obvious way to expand combinations, because the, the, the purists will, will say that the best uh, kind of combination would be something that has, uh, you're giving three or four drugs that have completely non-overlapping toxicities, um, and we don't necessarily have the knowledge uh, of, of, of the driver space in cancer to do that. But uh, we and others over the years have, have integrated a variety of data, perturbation data, from Project Achilles, you know, RNAi and CRISPR, uh, uh, pharmacologic data, and of course the cancer cell encyclopedia data, which we've been involved in with Novartis for many years. Um, and so in doing that, we uh, recently came across an unexpected synthetic lethal interaction that, uh, that actually engaged gratifyingly something on the left side of the long tail, which is, uh, you, you won't be able to read it, but uh, take my word for it, uh, CDK, the locus that involves deletion, and in particular homozygous deletion of CDKN2A, uh, this famous cell cycle inhibitor. So what we saw was that cells that contain homozygous deletion of this locus, the 9P21 locus, uh, tended to be highly dependent on two genes. One is PRMT5, another is called WDR77. Both of these are, are members of the methylosome compacts, which, which I'll describe more in a minute. But uh, what was interesting here 
uh, is that uh, th this is clearly an area, although it hasn't necessarily always received a lot of attention in cancer, it has a lot of the goods, uh, such as regulating signal transduction and uh, DNA repair and uh, splicing and uh, chromatin states. These are all, all things that we know to be relevant in cancer. And so we wanted to know why this might be going on. And the, this question was of interest because it, needed, it didn't need to be the case that, that CDK and 2A loss was the, uh, the link to the dependency. There's a gene right next door to CDK and 2A called MTAP, uh, which uh, is, and it's been known for a long time that this is commonly co-deleted with CDK and 2A. So either one of these could be the culprit. Uh, and it turns out MTEP itself is deleted very commonly together with uh, CDK and 2A uh, and many cancers. So Gregory Krukoff, who at the time was an outstanding computational biologist in the lab, uh, did some very elegant analyses uh, to take the CCLE cell lines that either were wild type or had only CDK and 2 loss or had both, and was able to show that actually it was MTAP loss that correlated with this uh, enhanced dependency on PRMT5 and WDR77. And, and you could see that this dependency was, was evident in every cell lineage in the cell encyclopedia. So this was a broad dependency linked to a common genetic alteration in cancer. Uh, we were able to show, I'm going to skip through a little bit of this, uh, knocking down either one, knocks down the whole complex. It really does look like a methylosome complex dependency. Uh, but, uh, but the reason why this was interesting, so MTA stands for methylthioadenosine. Uh, MTAP, the enzyme that's lost here, uh, normally converts it to, uh, to components of the aden adenosine and methionine uh, kind of salvage and biosynthesis pathway in cells. When you lose MTAP, this precursor, MTA, piles up. So one question was whether elevated MTA might contribute to the dependence. But the other question was, just in general, is this a new synthetic lethal opportunity? Because people have been trying to target MTAP synth uh, as a synthetic lethal component for a long time, but the efforts had really focused on purine biosynthesis, you know, things that we knew about, adenosine, salvage, et cetera. Now the question is, well, maybe PRMT5 or the methylosome complex would be an ideal target for exploiting this synthetic lethal dependency. So we went through, and I'm going to go relatively quickly to show that, for example, indeed, MTA is increased when you have lost MTAP, and, when, and, and that increase is correlated with sensitivity uh, to PRMT5 knockdown. You can now rescue that, though, by adding MTAP back. Uh, as, as, so this is, this is the levels of MTA. When you add it back, they fall nicely. Uh, and then uh, that also rescues the sensitivity, at least partially, uh, and very nice experiments done by Rick Wilson. And then, uh, so then the, the uh, mechanistically, it is, it is indeed the case that elevated MTA inhibits pure MT5 activity, uh, which is read out by what's called symmetric, symmetric dimethyl arginine. But you can see uh, that when you add MTAP, you get plenty of symmetric dimethyl arginine. However, either when you give MTA uh, or uh, when you, uh, so, so when you add MTA, you, you diminish that. Uh, and then in various isogenic contexts, you can see that uh, MTA itself uh, is going up, it inhibits PRMT5, and so you now bring down the level of PRMT5 activity uh, in cells that have MTAP loss. Um, now, fi the final point I'll make is that there's obviously great interest to see whether or not MT uh, PRMT5 inhibitors uh, could exploit this dependency, and we were initially somewhat disappointed to see that, well, although we could certainly see statistically differences in our isogenic MTAP positive and MGEC ne negative lines with an epizyme compound and with MTA itself, Boy, those differences weren't nearly as big as the shRNA uh, data that we saw. But it turns out that the reason for that is probably because of the mechanism of action of these inhibitors. And in particular, for example, the epizyme compound uh, that was published a couple of years ago is a uh, SAM cooperative uh, inhibitor, which means that uh, when, when uh, it, needs, uh, it needs a cofactor SAM to bind, when MTA is high, you don't have as much SAM binding, so it actually kind of makes sense why this didn't work. So now there, we're, there's a lot of excitement in the field about designing M, uh, PRMT5 inhibitors with different mechanisms of action that might be able to exploit uh, what appears to be a very strong genetic dependency. The model here, a specific model is that when MTAP is present, you, uh, you basically have enough uh, methylosome complex activity, so if you deplete it, the cells don't really die. However, when MTAP is absent, MTA goes up, MTA can inhibit the methylosome, and then now if you further bring it down by genetics or perhaps in the future uh, with the right kind of inhibitor, uh, you, you get to a point where uh, the cells die. So that could, in principle, be a basis for a therapeutic window. But the big picture here is that 
now we can imagine that you know PRM25 inhibitors or methylazolam complex inhibitors could now be part of combinations in a way that we weren't, wouldn't have been thinking about at all, and you can even have a genetic or molecular context in which you would uh, develop such uh, either single agent or combinations. So there's clearly a lot more to learn as we uh, carry these things forward. And so I'll just uh, conclude with this last slide, which is that, you know, it, we, we've clearly made a lot of progress conceptually and practically in testing hypotheses of precision medicine, but I think we're really still just at the end of the beginning. And when we look ahead to what we need to achieve, when we think about the importance of combinations and stratification, we need higher order combinations, but truthfully, we don't know how to do that yet. The higher order combinations are too toxic uh, to administer at doses that hit their targets. But what's exciting is that in the next decade or so, we will have an opportunity to be creative to try to overcome this paradox. If we can figure out how to overcome this paradox, either through alternative dosing and scheduling or new ways of delivering drugs, uh, now we are really going to be in business in terms of uh, delivering therapies in molecularly defined contexts uh, that can lead to lasting control. And hopefully that will be done, uh, uh, that will be happening a lot in our careers. So as, uh, as Dr. Soria mentioned, I've had a great pleasure of running, running a wonderful lab, uh, and uh, I have them to thank for now having a, a very exciting opportunity uh, to have a different kind of impact uh, and uh, look forward to interacting with many of you through that vantage point uh, during the coming days and years. So uh, I'll thank the many collaborators, many of whom I've mentioned, and I'll stop there. <laughs> very much for sharing your vision uh, about the future of oncology. I would like to ask you um, about uh, the fact that almost 50% of cancers have uh, three or more uh, driver uh, alteration. How this can be put in the perspective of treatment? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. So, uh, in fact, there may be there, there could be, you know, six, five to ten drivers if we uh, integrate non-somatic events uh, as well, and, and also the historical uh, discoveries from Bob Weinberg and others. So, it's a, it's a great question. I think, uh, and this is where I was getting at, I, that, you know, certainly, if we, if we use the long tail as our only model, I think it's going to be very complicated, maybe very difficult to come up with, with frameworks. On the other hand, if, the, if this idea of convergence, so in the area of drug resistance, we're thinking that there might be many individual mechanisms, but it converges onto uh, a smaller number of states. Well, if that is true in the cancer driver world as well, uh, then that would help us a lot because, you know, may, it may well be, after all, that, you know, m many MAP kinase-driven cancers you have to hit the MAP kinase pathway, whatever else you do. That's not sufficient, but you have to hit that. And there are a lot of cancers that have those kinds of alterations. Similarly, you know, there may be, um, there may be non genetic, so it, it may well be that, I mean, immunotherapy has taught us that mutational load writ large, regardless of the individual drivers, uh, can, can define contexts where a certain therapeutic modality will work. So I think the importance of kind of moving beyond the long tail into thinking about other molecular contexts or so, so genetic convergences and other molecular contexts that define prevalent subpopulations that could be targeted in the same way. I, I think, you know, bringing those kinds of frameworks or developing such frameworks could help us because you're right. We, we're not going to be able to chase the 0.5 percent. That's going to be a very inefficient and difficult road if that's the only thing we do. So maybe I'll just ask one question, Levi. Um, so, so the MTAP approach is really very elegant. I guess the question is, um, to what extent can that be extended to other tumor suppressors, like say VHL or 3P loss of heterozygosity or P53? Have, you, have we plumbed the depths now, or, or is there still any gold in the hills that we could look for in, you know, to, for synthesis? Uh, it's a great question. So I, I think the short answer is that there, there's definitely still room. And, and if you think about what's happened, so we, we've been in the field, we've been opportunistic. You know, the way that people have done this has either been to take one or two isogenic lines, you know, lesion plus, lesion minus, and do a screen, or to take, for example, you know, a couple, two or three hundred cells from the cell line encyclopedia and do a screen. But what that's done has sort of given us low-hanging fruit that happened to be there in the models that we have, but hasn't necessarily um, sampled all these spaces. So, you know, I think what's needed is 
uh, efforts that require, that, that combine the disease biology expertise and the you know, biochemical expertise of these particular you know, VHLs and other uh, proteins, uh, together with you know, maybe making many uh, isogenic lines from different contexts. So th there's a space in the middle there that hasn't necessarily been mined. So yeah, I, I think there's still room for these big. Uh